The Senate Special Committee on Aging held a forum on the current quality of care for individuals with Alzheimer's disease and the impact on their families. Participants include Assistant Health Secretary for Aging Kathy Greenlee, as well as representatives from assisted living facilities and Alzheimer's associations. The meeting of the Health Subcommittee is called to order, and today we have a hearing on Alzheimer's disease and its ongoing challenges, and I'll recognize myself for an opening statement. As many of us know, Alzheimer's disease is an irreversible progressive brain disease that slowly destroys memory and thinking skills and eventually even the ability to carry out the simplest tasks. Damage first strikes the areas of the brain that control memory and problems in memory are the first symptoms to be noticed in early stages of Alzheimer's disease. As deterioration progresses to other areas of the brain, problems with other brain functions develop as well, as severe Alzheimer's disease can affect every part of the brain and rob its victims of their very lives and dignity. Alzheimer's disease is fatal. It's estimated to be the sixth leading cause of death in our country. NIH estimates that as many as 5.1 million Americans may have Alzheimer's today, and this figure is expected to grow to 13.5 million Americans by 2050. The truth of the matter, though, is that these figures give an incomplete snapshot of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Alzheimer's is at the heart a family disease, as the intense caretaking that those afflicted with the disease requires places a heavy financial and emotional burden on the family. The serious medical complications related to Alzheimer's mean that caregivers often struggle to maintain work outside their home to earn a living while balancing a never-ending schedule of monitoring and treatment for family members living with the disease. For many adults, known as the sandwich generation, they're duly responsible for caring for their aging parents while they're also caring for their children. And Alzheimer's has a devastating impact not just on families but on our national economy. It's projected that the national cost associated with caring for those with Alzheimer's exceeds $172 billion each year, with the figure expected to rise to $1 trillion by 2050. And these costs represent the burden on Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance, caregiving, and out-of-pocket costs for families. Of this figure, $123 billion can be attributed to Medicare and Medicaid alone. Until we cure Alzheimer's, it's imperative that our health care system provide stronger support for families caring for loved ones with the disease. The Affordable Care Act, which we passed earlier this year, establishes the Community Living Assistance Services and Supports, or CLASS, program, a new national long-term care insurance option. This legislation also provides Medicare beneficiaries with free annual wellness visits, which may increase the detection of early cognitive impairment, enabling patients and families to better plan for care needs. And finally, the Affordable Care Act will ensure that Americans living with Alzheimer's disease and other pre-existing conditions will not have to worry about having their insurance coverage discontinued or denied. In the future, whether families are subject to the triumph of tragedy of Alzheimer's will be dependent on the innovation and in new drugs and therapies being investigated in laboratories across our nation. And today we're going to hear from the National Institute on Aging at the NIH about the great work their scientists are doing to better understand, diagnose, and treat Alzheimer's disease. NIA's translation objective objectives have focused on supporting early drug discovery and preclinical drug development of novel compounds for Alzheimer's therapy. We're also going to hear from the Coalition Against Major Diseases within the Critical Path Institute on its efforts to improve applied regulatory science and how this will strengthen our ability to treat diseases like Alzheimer's. And finally, we'll hear from the Alzheimer's Association and Alzheimer's Foundation of America about the key research they're supporting as, as well as their initiatives and resources that help support day-to-day caretaking of individuals with Alzheimer's. Now, many of the members of this committee have been touched by Alzheimer's and expressed interest in examining the complex issues related to the disease. I do want to highlight the exemplary leadership and advocacy for Alzheimer's disease by a member of our full committee, Mr. Markey. I think he is going to be able to come today, but he informed, you know, he's basically has been touched, of course, by his late mother's own struggle with this disease. And because that, and for a lot of reasons, he's been an energetic leader in Congress and also chairs the Congressional Caucus on Alzheimer's Disease. So I, he may be joining us later, but I did want to mention him today. And I'll now uh, recognize uh, for an opening statement our ranking member, Mr. Gingrey.
Mr. Chairman, thank you, and I certainly want to thank our witnesses for their patience with us today. Uh, the witnesses uh, will testify, uh, as we hear from them, uh, Alzheimer's disease presents a looming threat to the health of our nation, and today uh, I think the numbers as many as 5 million Americans in the United States have this dread disease, and the scientific community is in agreement that these numbers will only increase significantly in the coming years as our society ages. According to the United States Census Bureau, the number of seniors aged 65 and older will actually double to about 72 million in the next 20 years as these baby boomers all reach retirement age. However, as Dr. Morrison Borgard will testify, the generation behind them, I think this is what we refer to as Generation X, and these are the folks born between 1965 and 1980. It's a significantly smaller generation than the baby boomers. So why, it, why is this comparison significant for the purposes of the hearing today? As Alzheimer's is a degenerative and as of yet incurable disease that requires constant monitoring, the role of the main caregiver often falls to our family members, as we all know. According to a study conducted by the Alzheimer's Association, an estimated 11 million Americans provide 12.5 billion hours of unpaid care annually for people, usually their loved ones, uh, with Alzheimer's and other dementias. The disease also does require large amounts of medical care in addition to in-home and community-based services. This high use of medical services results in substantial cost to the federal government, states, employers, and indeed families. If the number of Alzheimer's patients does indeed double over the next 20 years, uh, as many predict it will, we could be facing a health care crisis if the numbers of family caregivers declines and, of course, the costly care for these patients ultimately shifts to paid health care professionals. Alzheimer's disease is also a personal issue for me. My wife's mother, Laura Neal Ayers, was a very healthy and vibrant 88-year-old woman, she didn't hear very well. I think she loved that. But she was, she was active. She loved to watch sports. And, and she spent time in her room uh, every day watching baseball. Her husband, uh, Bill Ayers, actually played baseball for the New York Giants in the 1940s. Uh, and Laura uh, picked up her love of the game from her husband. Watching baseball became one of her favorite pastimes. And thoughts of spring training, I think, kept her warm all went along. Seemingly overnight, uh, all of that changed. She was diagnosed with dementia, and we suspect Alzheimer's, halfway through her 89th year, and, and the woman that we know and love was changed forever. Gone was the active woman, 88, and her place was a woman that seemingly was trapped inside her own body, unable to enjoy the comforts of these golden years. I cannot begin to describe how emotionally destructive this disease was, as many of you, I'm sure, know not only for my mother-in-law, but for my entire family. Uh, there are many stories like this one that help underscore the importance of finding a cure. Uh, today, there are no known treatments to prevent, cure, or even delay the onset of Alzheimer's. The five drugs currently approved by the FDA have been shown to be successful in reducing the symptoms of the disease, but much more needs to be done to ultimately find a cure. And so with that thought in mind, I would like to welcome all of our witnesses here today, uh, specifically, I'm interested in hearing from Dr. Mark uh, Cantillon, the Executive Director of the Coalition Against Major Diseases for the Critical Path Institute. As Dr. Cantillon will touch on in his, in his testimony, the goal of his organization is to pr promote a forum for scientists from the FDA, academia, and industry to evaluate innovative testing methods for the use in drug development. Uh, as members of this subcommittee have heard during past hearings, pharmaceutical drug development in the United States can benefit from greater collaboration between industry and the FDA. To the FDA's credit, they have recognized this fact in many areas, including antibiotic drug development, something for which I and a bipartisan group of members on this subcommittee will be advancing uh, pieces of legislation in the 112th Congress. As a representative of the citizens of the 11th of Georgia, I believe that government works best when its processes are constantly scrutinized and reform when necessary to ensure they work 
as efficiently as possible. That theory applies not only to Congress and the White House, but government agencies as well. Therefore, I hope to learn more about this uh, uh, phrase, uh, applied regulatory science, during the question and answer portion of the hearing and how it might improve patient access to quality care. Mr. Chairman, thank you for scheduling this hearing today. And, and with that, I see that my time has expired and I will yield back. Thank you, Mr. Gingry. Oh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I did want to ask for unanimous consent to submit for the record uh, our actual subcommittee ranking member, uh, Mr. Shimkus, uh, a study that comes out of John Hopkins, evidence for neurocognitive uh, plasticity and at-risk older adults and the experience of that study, if there's no objection. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, next, for an opening statement, uh, the gentlewoman from California, our Vice Chair, Ms. Capps. Thank you, Chairman Pallone, for holding this, the final health subcommittee of the 111th Congress. And I want to thank you um, for your wonderful service as chairman over the last four years. Alzheimer's disease is a very topical subject for this hearing because the challenges faced by patients and their loved ones are so reflective of the challenges we face throughout our healthcare system. Long term, these are some of the challenges which fit uh, all, with Alzheimer's so well. Long term care availability and its costs. Respite care an adequate workforce, and research for better treatments and a cure. Now that's just touching the surface of the many challenges that we face with this and so many other chronic conditions. But thankfully and thankfully, the new health care uh, law uh, provides much re needed relief for many of these concerns. One of these is the new long-term care insurance option. There is also Medicare prescription cost relief. And there's opportunities for training the next generation of health professionals. In addition, the Cures Acceleration Network, along with what my, uh, our chairman mentioned as the Class Act. Um, and of course, we have a lot more that we should undertake now within this framework of the new legislation. Some of these other steps we can take, such as passage of legislation that I'm very proud to co-sponsor in the National Alzheimer's Act, uh, I know we're going to be, you're going to be addressing today in your testimony, including the National Alzheimer's Project. And so with the goal being that we can provide and develop a, a comprehensive strategy for how to address Alzheimer's disease, how to continue, as many of you have been doing over these past many years. Um, so I do look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about the latest in Alzheimer's research. I understand there are some very cri uh, critical breakthroughs uh, that have uh, been working their way through the clinical trials and so forth. Uh, and, and also what you see for us in guidance in the next Congress as pressing needs that patients, and so many of them increasing numbers, uh, their family members and caregivers are, are going to experience. As has also been mentioned, uh, there is probably not one person in this room who hasn't been touched personally by this devastating disease. Uh, and we need to know, it's a crisis proportion really in our society now, how best to equip ourselves and our communities uh, to cope with it. So I yield back and look forward to today's uh, hearing. Thank you. And I also wanted to uh, thank you also uh, as the vice chair. You've been You're really welcome. tremendously helpful and so much so often uh, giving us insight on, on issues because of your practical experience also as a nurse and your background. So thank you. Our next uh, uh, member for an opening statement is a gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Barrow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you also for your leadership throughout the 111th Congress on this committee. Um, the poet said that comparisons are odious, and at the personal level, no one wants to have their personal trauma or tragedy compared to somebody else's. But at the level of public health and social impact, I think some comparisons are useful. The scourge of cancer has many faces. The scourge of Alzheimer's has a very definite uh, profile, many different impacts on folks, but a very different impact in terms of the family. And I think it's useful to point out that we didn't really begin to marshal the nation's resources in the war on cancer until it was so folks could say, you know, everybody knows somebody who's been touched by cancer. 
Well, I think it's fair to say that everybody now knows somebody who's been touched by Alzheimer's. Everybody knows the particular impact it has on family and on the communities of interest around families that is the hallmark of this, of this dread disease. And so I think we can take inspiration from the fact that so many folks are impacted by this. I think it's important to point out also uh, in, in ways that, that supplement what others have said, the cost of this disease, that the uncompensated care and the out-of-pocket expense to our system is staggering and growing exponentially in ways that I think uh, compare um, very unfavorably uh, to some of the other diseases that we deal with at a, at a social level. Right now we're spending something like 170 plus billion dollars a year in compensated and uncompensated care, taking into account the fair market value of the services that folks are being forced to render and not getting any kind of compensation for it all. That's, that's coming, out of our, coming out of our social product, our gross social product. It's projected to cost our society something on the order of a trillion dollars a year at current growth levels by the time we reach 2050. So it's staggering in its potential for exponential growth and impact on folks. The point is, this is not only the right thing to do in terms of the quality of the life of folks affected by this, it's never been truer to say that this is not only the right thing to do, but it's the smart thing for us to do, to marshal our resources in more effectively and economically managing and treating and preventing this dread disease. So with that, I look forward to hearing the testimony of our witnesses and thank them for coming today. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for making this the, the last hearing of this committee and this Congress a very large issue we're going to be dealing with for a very long time. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Barrow. Next, the gentlewoman from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Christensen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing. And, and thank you. Welcome to the folks who are here to testify. And thank you not only for taking the time to be here, but for the work that all of you are doing. Um, I really appreciate the approach that's being taken to this devastating disease, a disease that's devastating to not only individuals, but families and communities, and potentially to our country because it's a holistic approach, um, looking at prevention, treatment, and research, but also looking at the caregivers who are often forgotten. I wanted to call attention to the several areas. First, due to the, first, the cost of care. Due to the cost of care, this disease has the potential to bankrupt our healthcare system unless we invest in all of these aspects today. In fact, by 2050, it's estimated that 13.5 million Americans will be suffering from Alzheimer's and the cost might be as much as $1 trillion a year. Second, there's a grave discrepancy between the funding for research for this sixth leading cause of death compared to other leading causes of death where billions are being spent compared to just over 400 million on Alzheimer's. Third, I I want to call attention to the fact that racial and ethnic minorities are disproportionately impacted by Alzheimer's, with African Americans being twice more likely and Hispanic Americans 1.5 more likely to suffer from Alzheimer's and other dementias, despite the fact that they're underdiagnosed compared to their white counterparts. And I wanted to also mention two other pieces of legislation just to show that the Congressional Black Caucus has really been aware and engaged in this um, issue for several years. One is H.R. 4123, the Alzheimer's Treatment and Caregivers Support Act introduced by Representative Maxine Waters, and H.R. 1192, the Alzheimer's Family Assistance Act introduced by Eddie Bernice Johnson. Both of these bills, like the others that are being mentioned in the testimonies will help to take the fight against Alzheimer's several steps forward and be a part of the solution to this devastating problem. So again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you for being here. I thank the gentlewoman. And uh, next is the gentleman from Pennsylvania, I mean from Ohio, Mr. Space. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today is my, uh, my final hearing uh, in committee. Uh, and I wanted to first uh, express my gratitude uh, to Mr. Chairman uh, and to Chairman Waxman, as well as uh, members on both sides of the aisle, for their work in some of those profound issues of the day and even uh, a generation, issues like uh, energy and health care and uh, the transformational effect that, uh, that uh, the whole broadband era has brought uh, to this country and to our culture. And uh, while we didn't accomplish everything that I think we had set out to accomplish, we got a lot done. And there's a lot to be done. Um, my district uh, back in Ohio is a very rural district. It's uh, Appalachian, Ohio, uh, where the people are good and they work hard and 
a lot of good things going for us back there, but there are a lot of challenges that we have, and the, we share those challenges uh, with the rest of rural America. And one of the things that's unique about this committee, I think, is the effect that it can have on bridging the divide that exists between urban and suburban America and rural America. And certainly, a divide does exist when it comes to accessing education, certainly with regards to accessing health care. And I encourage the committee to be uh, every bit as ambitious in tackling some of those challenges in the upcoming uh, session of Congress. Uh, with respect to the issue of today, Alzheimer's, um, I, I uh, sympathize with the remarks of my colleague and friend from Georgia, Mr. Barrow. 172 billion dollars a year. Uh, those are warlike numbers. Uh, in other words, those are the kind of numbers you spend when you go to war. If you couple uh, the amount of money that we're spending as a society on a disease like Alzheimer's with what we're spending on diseases like diabetes and cancer, and the list goes on and on, it soon reaches the trillion dollar level. In fact, Alzheimer's alone by the year 2050 will reach that level. And we cannot sustain that as an economy. When John Barrow says it's not only the humane thing to do, it's the right thing to do, uh, what he's saying is uh, if it's not important enough to deal with these issues simply because of the mitigation of human suffering that, that occurs as a result of these diseases, then certainly uh, we should be able to justify it because of the cost. And. Uh, like Alzheimer's and diabetes and cancer, the answer, uh, at least from the congressional perspective, is in medical research. Uh, we cannot simply rely upon the private sector to tackle these diseases, not simply because it's not the right thing to do, but we can't afford it. For every dime we invest today in research, we will return, receive a return of dollars in the future, many dollars. So I urge this committee in future efforts, including its efforts with regards to Alzheimer's, to bear in mind the obligation that we have as an institution, as a government, uh, and the duty we have to our people to conquer these diseases through early diagnosis, advanced diagnosis, advanced treatment, and above all, cure. Let's not forget cure. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, again, thank you for your leadership, and uh, it has been a pleasure serving on your committee. Mr. Chairman, uh, yes. could I have a brief point of personal privilege, Absolutely. friendly point of personal privilege? Uh, let me first of all to my friend from Ohio, Mr. Space, and truly is my friend, and he and I know that. Uh, indeed, we will miss him. Uh, he's a, a, a great member with a great heart, and I think the words that he just expressed to this committee uh, indicate the type of person that he is. And uh, Zach, we will miss you, and I really enjoyed serving with you, and I hope we'll keep in touch, my friend. Uh, also, I wanted to say to you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and, I, and I say this on behalf of my colleagues who I guess are uh, on airplanes about now trying to get home to their families, but uh, and not the least of which, of course, would be ranking member John Shimkus. Uh, we have really enjoyed uh, serving uh, with you, under you, on this Health Subcommittee of Energy and Commerce not always agreeing on every vote, in fact, uh, disagreeing a lot of times, but uh, no one could be uh, more agreeable uh, when he disagrees. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, we respect you and uh, have hold you in high regard and look forward to serving with you in the 112th. Well, thank you. I really uh, appreciate that, and I, I want to say the same about you. I mean, your, your input... Uh, not only as a physician, but just in general, has been fantastic. And, you know, I, I, I kind of wish that Mr. Shimkus was here today, too, because I wanted to say how easy it was to work with him uh, in the last, uh, I guess it's not two years, it's a little over a year or so. Um, and it is true, I think, that even though we often disagree on a lot of issues, that we have been able to work together on many issues. And I, it kind of bothers me sometimes when we 
you know, when the, the media, I guess, pays attention to the differences and doesn't highlight how many bills we've actually passed out and worked on together and got signed into law that were very important uh, uh, for the American people. So thank you. And let me say about Mr. Space, I, I again, I, I know that I'm really going to miss him. I mean, he's really contributed a lot, and he has been a friend on so many different issues. So thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, we'll get to our panel. Um, let, me, um, let me welcome you, first of all. Um, we only have one panel today, so I'll introduce the members. Starting on my left is uh, Dr. Marcel Morrison Bogorod, who is Director of the Division of Neuroscience at the National Institute on Aging with the National Institutes of Health. And next is Mr. Harry Johns, who is President and Chief Executive Officer of the Alzheimer's Association. And then we have Mr. Eric J. Hall, who's President and Chief Executive Officer of the Alzheimer's Foundation of America. And finally, Dr. Mark Cantillon. Did I pronounce it right? Canti oh, it's French. Okay. Cantillon. Cantillon. Okay. Who is Executive Director of the Coalition Against Major Disease uh, from the Critical Path Institute and also happens to be a constituent, so I should know how to pronounce his name, uh, from one of my towns, Keensburg. So thank you. Uh, in particular for being here today. Uh, we have five-minute opening statements that become part of the record, and each of you uh, can also submit additional statements in writing for inclusion, if you like. Uh, and I'll now recognize Dr. Morrison Bo Bogorat. Thank you very much, Chairman Florin, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I really thank you for inviting me to be here before you today to discuss the pressing issue of Alzheimer's. The National Institute on Aging is the lead agency, or the lead institute for Alzheimer's disease at the NIH. And one of our responsibilities is outreach. So in this regard, I want to tell you that you can now download, download copies of our 2009 congressionally mandated NIH progress report on Alzheimer's research from the NIA website. I am retiring at the end of this year, and a very sad that a cure for Alzheimer's, thank you, has not been found on my watch. But the momentum is there, and I believe that my successor will have this joy. Federal researchers, other scientific agencies, the private sector, and not-for-profit are collaborating as never before to try to solve the mysteries of this disease. For example, we have regular meetings with each of the entities that will testify at this hearing. We have partnered with the Alzheimer's Association on many occasions, and ongoing as a joint venture on updating the definition of AD. The Alzheimer's Foundation of America and other organizations held House and Senate briefings a couple of weeks ago where Richard Hurdis, director of NIA, was asked to testify. And we work with the Coalition Against Major Diseases for the Critical Path Institute on matters related to innovations in marker use and clinical trials. The NIA plans and manages an extensive program to better treat and ultimately to prevent Alzheimer's. How do we do this? Well, from our Alzheimer's Summit in 2006, the 2010 State of the Science Conference, from numerous specialized workshops, from program review by our NIA Council every four years, we get input from all these sources. And from these, decide on the best ways to advance Alzheimer's research, commensurate with her funding. For example, at the 2006 summit, it was recommended that we develop a project focusing on early onset AD families. We have since funded the international dominantly inherited Alzheimer's network to study preclinical disease in these families. Earlier this year, an NIH State of the Science conference reported that there was so far insufficient evidence that any behavioral interventions for AD or age-related cognitive decline were effective, and that we ought to devote more resources to these questions. 
Even before the report was finalized, we had stepped up our funding of clinical trials to get definitive evidence whether or not various exercise and cognitive interventions might impact age-related cognitive decline, mild cognitive impairment, and AD. Now we are funding around 20 such trials. The Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative is another example of our leadership. ADNI is a very successful public-private partnership to identify biological and imaging markers for better ways of monitoring AD clinical trials, and also identifying persons at risk for the disease preclinically. Here we initiated the process through a series of meetings where we brought together all interested parties to discuss what initiative would be most useful for them for development in a pre-competitive setting. And these discussions led to funding of ADNI in 2004 with substantial financial support from industry and from not-for-profits such as the Alzheimer's Association, coordinated by the Foundation for NIH. Another aspect of our planning process is to ask our director for funds to specifically target new areas that need to be developed. An example is our translational initiative. Partly through these targeted funds, this important and innovative portfolio has grown to over 60 projects, each aimed squarely at bringing a new drug to the stage where it can get FDA approval for performing clinical trials. This is a particularly important area for us to develop, as pharmaceutical companies are often unwilling to put monies into the beginnings of the drug discovery process and translational research. One reason that drug trials have not worked so far may be that the drugs are given too late in the disease to have any effect. But prevention trials to test this possibility take a lot of money and time under current protocols. We are developing new methodologies, and in the meantime, we have been able to fund a number of prevention trials by the simple way of adding cognitive measures onto trials started for other clinical conditions, often by other institutes. So it's a cheap way of funding these trials. But other possible drug therapies for Alzheimer's are directed against unique aspects of the disease. And so for these more specialized interventions, NLIA must continue to develop AD-specific trials. We make difficult decisions all the time about where to put our resources. We do not have a crystal ball to tell us what approach will eventually pay off in relieving suffering from this frightening disease. We are committed to trying every promising avenue, and we will succeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Mr. Harry Johns. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Pallone, uh, distinguished members of the committee. Uh, I want to also thank uh, Ranking Member Shimkus uh, and all of you for holding this hearing this afternoon. My name is Harry Johns. I'm the President and CEO of the Alzheimer's Association. The Alzheimer's Association was created in 1980 and is the leading voluntary health organization in both the provision of Alzheimer's care and support and in the funding of Alzheimer's research as the largest nonprofit funder of Alzheimer's research in the world. To do our job well, we spend a lot of time listening, uh, listening to people with Alzheimer's, to their caregivers, their families, uh, to researchers, our many collaborators, and to hundreds of thousands of our advocates. Uh, we hear their stories and experiences, and they inspire us to go further, faster, uh, to provide better care and ultimately the cure that we all seek. 
we listen to those families in your districts and we listen to our own families. Uh, my mother had Alzheimer's disease herself. Any of us who have seen the disease up close don't want to see it again for anyone to have the disease or to be a caregiver. Regrettably, we know it's going to happen much more ahead of us. You know, the effects of Alzheimer's, as it's been stated previously, are truly devastating at the human level. You know, in this country alone, as um, previously referenced, we estimate actually there are about 5.3 million people who have the disease, about 200,000 of them younger onset, younger than 65. Uh, and by the middle of the century, it could be as high as 13 and a half or even as high as 16 million individuals in the United States alone. Already today, there are 35 million people worldwide who have the disease. Today, if you do develop Alzheimer's, we can say with certainty, absolute certainty, uh, that you'll either die with the disease or of it. And of the 10 leading <coughs> causes of death, as previously mentioned, Alzheimer's is now sixth. Alzheimer's is growing by far the most rapidly, a 50% increase, <clears throat> excuse me, a 50% increase between 2000 and 2007, the last year that statistics are available. And it's the only one of the top 10 causes of death that has nothing that to do to prevent, stop, or even slow it. For perspective, even though Alzheimer's is likely seriously underreported, Already today, it's killing more people than diabetes and more people than breast cancer and prostate cancer combined. The, 1 million care, the 11 million caregivers, I should say, in the United States, Alzheimer's can literally take everything they have to give. Uh, their time, their money, uh, their jobs, and their own good health. Uh, and it happens every day, oftentimes never to be recovered. Uh, one study at least indicates that people who are caring for a spouse with Alzheimer's can actually predecease the individual with the disease. And the economic impact of Alzheimer's is also devastating. Truly staggering numbers. Uh, you've already mentioned the $172 billion in costs today for Alzheimer's going as high as $1 trillion by the middle of the century. Uh, which was reported in the Alzheimer's Association's trajectory report earlier uh, this year. And those are in today's dollars. Those are not inflated dollars. Those are dollars rated in today's terms. A total of $20 trillion over the next 40 years just to pay for the care, of the care costs, not an additional cent for the research we so badly need. And our country is simply not ready for this onslaught of Alzheimer's that's already upon us. Let's take the case of research funding. Uh, you know, we've made significant progress in other diseases, in fact, in no small part because of the significant investments we've made in those diseases. Research spending at the federal level for cancer is about $6 billion today. For cardiovascular disease, about $4 billion. For HIV AIDS, it's about $3 billion. Uh, now, all of those are good investments. They've paid off in lives saved. And they're going to continue to pay in that way for our country. Um, but in Alzheimer's, we're only spending $469 million a year, despite those other huge impacts we've already discussed. We know that more money invested in research saves lives, but we also know that too little money invested in research actually costs lives and ultimately will drive those very huge care costs into the trillions. Today, right now, we spend $250 in America on care costs for Alzheimer's and dementia compared to $1 invested in research, 250 to 1. So to address the underinvestment in Alzheimer's research, the Alzheimer's Association strongly uh, supports the Breakthrough Act. It's a bill that authorizes $2 billion uh, in Alzheimer's research. But the Alzheimer's Association will not ask others to do what we won't do ourselves. Uh, we play uh, an unparalleled role in the research uh, community in Alzheimer's uh, globally as well as in the United States. And that certainly includes direct investment in Alzheimer's uh, and effectively investing in science. Our peer-reviewed research program since its inception has funded $279 million worth of research to 1,900 investigators, uh, making us the largest funder in the nonprofit world. 
And through partnerships and our own funding, we've played some kind of a part in every major advance over the past 30 years as a result. But as I discuss these necessary investments in Alzheimer's research and more broadly, I certainly recognize that our country is currently engaged in a very appropriate and very necessary conversation about our fiscal situation. <clears throat> Excuse me, our fiscal situation as a country. And we have to address that. Uh, but Alzheimer's unaddressed is one of our most devastating uh, issues, both human and financial, as we've all discussed. Uh, so we must aim at what is the highest return potential we have for investments. Alzheimer's is one of them. So if we can't fix Alzheimer's, I don't think we can fix Medicare. Medicare costs three times more for each individual in the system who has Alzheimer's than it does for a normal individual. In Mr. The Johns, I, I've been trying not to cut anybody off because we only have the one panel. Let me wrap really quick, quickly then. <laughs> All right, can, thanks. Chairman, uh, you know, certainly uh, I want to uh, mention the National Alzheimer's Project Act, and I want to uh, uh, thank this committee uh, for its leadership. Certainly, again, want to recognize uh, 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 Member Congressman Markey, who you mentioned, for his leadership as the author. Certainly recognize Dr. Burgess, who's already provi also provided leadership on this. And we uh, know, of course, the Senate passed the bill yesterday. We look forward to the real possibility of the House passing it. We urge you to pass it. And we look forward to working with this committee and, and, uh, and the Congress to realize the ambition of the Alzheimer's Association, its vision a world without Alzheimer's disease. Thank you. Mr. Hall. Chairman Pallone, uh, members of the committee, uh, thank you so much for convening this hearing and for inviting the Alzheimer's Foundation of America to testify. Uh, I am Eric J. Hall. I am the AFA's founding president and chief executive officer, and I am truly honored uh, to be here to testify on behalf of our member organizations and families that we care for uh, across the country. Uh, AFA was formed in February of 2002 to provide optimal care and services to individuals confronting dementia and to their caregivers and families through member organizations dedicated to improving quality of life. Today, our membership consists of more than 1,400 organizations organizations, including grassroots not-for-profit organizations, government agencies, public safety departments, and long-term care communities. Our services include a toll-free hotline staffed by licensed social workers, educational materials, Care Advantage, which is a free quarterly family caregiver magazine that right now reaches about one million readers, professional training programs, AFA Teens, which is a web-based support and scholarship program, and our National Memory Screening Day. As a foundation, our money is generated and dispersed by grants to service organizations as well as respite grants to families uh, who are in need. Recognizing the severe fiscal challenges facing our nation, it is more important than ever to leverage available private sector resources in a cost-effective manner to support public sector initiatives. AFA makes substantial investments in care and services to tackle the enormous challenges associated with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias for both individuals and their family caregivers. But the needs of the population are going to overwhelm our resources in the years to come. The National Institute of Aging reports that as many as 5.1 million Americans over 65 are today dying with Alzheimer's disease. And those numbers are projected to increase dramatically in the coming years. The rapidly rising costs associated with this disease will put an enormous, heavily uh, burden on families, businesses, and government economically. It is our opinion that increased investment in preventing, treating, and or curing chronic diseases of the aging, such as Alzheimer's disease, is perhaps the most a single most effective strategy in reducing national spending on health care. Chronic diseases associated with aging account for more than 75 percent of Medicare and other federal health expenditures. Unprecedented increases in these diseases as a population ages are one reason why the Congressional Budget Office projects that total spending on health care will rise to 25 percent of the U.S. GDP by 2025. Simply put, our nation does not have the luxury of time to wait to address the health research needs of this population. 
Standard & Poor's recent report titled Global Aging 2010 and Irreversible Truth stated that no other force no other force is likely to shape the future of national economic health, public finances, and or policy making as the irreversible rate at which the world's population is aging. Standard & Poor's believes that the cost of caring for people will profoundly affect growth prospects and dominate public finance policy debates worldwide. As we have learned from the experience that we have all had with polio, heart disease, HIV, AIDS, cardiovascular, and other diseases, medical research and breakthroughs can have a profound impact in reducing health care costs. At the extension, as the extension of life expectancy from age 47 in 1900 to almost 80 in 2000 demonstrates, medical advances enormously increase national productivity and prosperity. Yet, those benefits can only come about if NIH makes the needed investments in research aimed at preventing, treating, or curing age-related diseases and extending healthy life. AFA, again, recognizes the serious fiscal challenges facing our nation, which will require Congress to carefully scrutinize future funding priorities. We believe it is critical to leverage available resources within the private sector, including not-for-profit organizations such as our own, to support proven cost-effective initiatives, and that's why we will all need Congress to be our partner. This subcommittee and full Energy and Commerce Committee have played a critical role in overseeing and supporting the mission of the NIH, and we respectfully urge your support for continued commitment to NIA's important research. AFA is seeking $1.4 billion, an increase of $300 million in fiscal year 2012 National Institute of Health budget, specifically for the National Institute of Aging. This funding is the minimum essential to sustain the research needed to make progress in attacking the chronic diseases that are driving mass increases in our national health care costs. That level of funding would make the NIA's baseline consistent with comparable research initiatives conducted elsewhere under the auspices of NIH. If NIA funding is not significantly increased, we stand to lose a generation of more young and emerging investigators in aging and Alzheimer's disease. This would be an enormous waste since the NIA is poised to accelerate the scientific discoveries that can be translated quickly into effective prevention and efficient health care to reduce the burden of this silver tsunami of age-associated chronic diseases. Breakthroughs from NIA research can lead to treatments and public health interventions that can delay the onset or slow the progression of costly conditions such as heart disease, stroke, diabetes, bone fractures, age-related blindness, Parkinson's, and indeed Alzheimer's disease. From a budgetary perspective alone, such advances could save trillions of dollars by the middle of this current century. At the Alzheimer's Foundation of America, our incredible strength and our quick success has come from collaboration. AFA looks forward to working with members of the subcommittee to address the important issues raised in today's hearing and in the long term to end the devastation caused by Alzheimer's disease. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Dr. Cantillon. Mr. Chairman, members and committee. Is the mic on? Yeah, um. I have to bring it close. Mr. Chairman, members and Good. staff, thank you for the opportunity to present testimony on this very important topic. I'm Dr. Mark Canty, I'm the Executive Director of the Coalition Against Major Disease uh, of the Critical Path Institute, also known as CPATH. I'm a practicing physician and a neuroscientist with 15 years experience in research and drug development at the NIH, academia, nursing homes, and within the pharmaceutical industry. CPATH is a non-profit organization founded in 2005 by the FDA and the Arizona community in order to build collaborations that identify more reliable and efficient methods to test new medicines, applied regulatory science. As you have heard, in spite of the exciting laboratory discoveries in Alzheimer's research, we lack full translation. We lack new medicines that could significantly alter the course of the disease. And indeed, we've seen huge Alzheimer's disease drug trials fail. Nevertheless, there is reason for renewed hope. Across the hall in the science is a proverb written up that I'd like to quote. Where there is no vision, 
the people perish. Proverbs. Thanks to the work of this subcommittee, the FDA Amendments Act of 2007 included a provision for the FDA to create the critical path public-private partnerships. We're extremely grateful to Congresswoman Warsha Blackburn of Tennessee, Congressman Elliot Engel of New York, and Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords of Arizona for their leadership on this legislation. The Coalition Against Major Diseases, or CAMD, was one of the first of these partnerships launched by the FDA, and it's already creating and identifying new tools that will speed the safe development of new medicines for Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases. CAMD seeks to recreate the sense of urgency and open collaboration that made the unprecedented rapid progress against AIDS possible. Sharing of knowledge was a hallmark and is generally accepted as the reason that the rapid and enduring success was secured against that epidemic. Created by CPATH and the Engelberg Center of the Brookings Institute, CAMD is a consortium that currently includes scientists from 12 major pharmaceutical companies, NIH scientists, as well as experts from patient organizations such as my colleagues here today, the Alzheimer's Association and Alzheimer's Foundation. The FDA, along with the European Medicines Agency, the EMA, and indeed the Japanese PMDA, provide advisors to our over 250 scientists who participate in CAMD by sharing what they know about Alzheimer's disease and how they better can test new, new therapies. CAMD's accomplishments have already changed the way we tackled this devastating disease. Firstly, CAMD uh, uh, researchers compared the way that they and other researchers score dementia, score dementia in a clinical trial, and subsequently corrected over a dozen inconsistencies. Now it's possible for them and for EMA and FDA to compare results directly from study to study. This is a great example of applied regulatory science because it improves the quality, the accuracy, and efficiency of decisions made by both the regulators and the regulated industry, the pharmaceutical industry. A first ever, CAMD was able to pool the data from 11 clinical trials conducted by seven different pharmaceutical companies. This has created the largest publicly available Alzheimer's disease database in the world and it describes the natural course of the disease in over 4,000 patients. Over 200 teams of scientists around the world are already using this, for example, modeling. In the past, pharma scientists had to design trials based on their clinical experience or data within the company or what they read in the medical literature. This database allows the individual patient level data to show progression over time in this number of patients. This is far more precise than their clinical experience or what they could glean from the medical literature. This database also allows them to more accurately predict the outcome for a particular trial or how long the trial must be or how many patients must be included, indeed how genetic subsets of the population might respond differently, etc. CAMD is now working with the NIH and with academic centers to pool their data in the same standardized database to further enrich this as a leading edge tool. CAMD is also helping define the FDA's new qualification process described in the new guidance. In this work, CAMD submits data and requests that the FDA accept certain brain imaging tools or cerebral spinal fluid tests as qualified for identifying, identifying patients much earlier in their disease when there is still brain function to be saved. Yes, there are many reasons for hope. The critical path public-private partnership is improving the applied regulatory science for Alzheimer's at the FDA. However, we do need your help. Understaffing is a serious problem throughout the FDA and is especially critical for CAMD. The FDA needs your support to be able to dedicate the required number of scientists and staff to participate in CAMD and other critical path partnerships. This is the kind of applied clinical science that is changing the way drugs are tested and evaluated today so that Alzheimer's can be prevented, not just slowed. I thank you for the opportunity to provide this testimony and everybody in the CAMD thanks you for your leadership and foresight in authorizing the FDA's critical path public-private partnerships that are giving new hopes to patients and families at risk for this dis devastating disease. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Doctor, and thank all of you. We'll take questions from the uh, members, and I'll start with myself, and I'll start with uh, Dr. Morrison uh, Borgerod. Um, scientists know Alzheimer's attacks the brain long before people exhibit cognitive decline, but the specifics are crucial. 
uh, because so far drug after drug has failed to effectively treat Alzheimer's in people who already show symptoms. And I, I know you mentioned, you suggested that that was part of the problem, is that you know perhaps the answer is earlier treatment before you actually have uh, the signs of the disorder. So what I wanted to ask is why are biological markers, whether gene mutations or pathological brain changes, important to the development of effective treatments for Alzheimer's? And what research is NIA conducting to better understand these markers? And I'm, I'm sort of going back to that same issue that you mentioned, which is that you know we don't seem to have, perhaps we should be starting earlier, but then we would have to know whether people have the disorder. Well, it's probably uh, one of the, the items that we're putting most of our effort into these days because we do think that understanding the earlier stages of Alzheimer's disease are very important. And we've, we've thought that ever since we reissued the request for applications for funding our Alzheimer's disease centers across the country because, oh, about eight years ago now, we said to them, forget about late stages of disease. We want you to really, really concentrate on the earlier stages. So we've thought about this for quite a long time. And obviously, one of the things that's held us up has not been able, be, has not been able to identify preclinical stages. That's one of the things that's really being addressed by the Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging initiative. Because um, especially in people who aren't yet showing symptoms or in people who are developing mild cognitive impairment, which is a precursor to Alzheimer's, researchers working together with um, industry and, and people funded by us are identifying markers in the cerebrospinal fluid. And these markers are um, lowered beta amyloid and higher levels of a protein called tau that signal that a person is approaching the stage of mild cognitive impairment. The other technology which has been developed by ADNI and by others is actually being able to look at in the brains of individuals cerebral amyloid plaques through positron emission tomography, through imaging. And, and this is perhaps the most amazing breakthrough of the last several years because that has allowed us to see that in a number of folk, older folk, older than 65 or 70, about 20% of these folk who otherwise would have of as, as normal, who are quite normal, kinds of amyloid plaques in their brain that in some cases are equivalent to a person with Alzheimer's disease who can't at the moment function for themselves. So these two, the, the CSF markers and the brain markers, are two ways we have of identifying preclinical disease, which we didn't have before. And they could be used to identify people who've got markers in the brain, amyloid in the brain, for earlier clinical trials than we're able to do right now. So I agree, it's, it's, it's really, really, really important that we develop these markers and that we use them to do more efficient clinical trials in the preclinical stage. I had a, a second question, but I maybe would prefer if anybody else wanted to comment on on uh, this issue because I think it's pretty important. Would any of you, any of the others, like to? Well, I, I'd simply add that uh, what Marcel has said is uh, certainly one of the most exciting areas that is occurring in Alzheimer's research today. Uh, she's indicated we've worked together on this, and the. Um, at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference on Alzheimer's Disease over the summer, uh, there was um, significant fi there were significant findings uh, released on this very front. It is it is potential 
to go to the point where we can actually identify Alzheimer's pre-symptomatically uh, in the future. It is not yet ready for the clinic. That's for the lab at this point. Uh, that is a significant set of advances uh, that are very important to us. What's, of course, though, very important is we have a parallel in treatments. Uh, right now, we're making faster advances on the diagnostic science than we are on the treatment side. So what we really need to do is catch that up, and that's one of the most important reasons for the additional funding that's really needed for Alzheimer's disease. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Gingrey? Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, I think I'll shift uh, then uh, to the treatment uh, aspect of it uh, and, and maybe come back to very interesting things that uh, the two of you have just talked about in regard to early diagnosis. Uh, Dr. Cantillon, I hope I did better. I know I botched that up pretty bad the first time. Uh, I have a lot of respect for the work that the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, performs. But that being said, I'm interested in exploring how the FDA drug approval process might be improved uh, in, the, in the hope it may help spur greater drug development for diseases such as, as Alzheimer's. I think I mentioned in my opening remarks that uh, I have uh, introduced legislation along with my colleagues here on the committee, uh, Energy and Commerce Committee, Health Subcommittee, bipartisan. Mr. Green and uh, Ms. DeGette uh, on the Democratic side and myself and Mr. Rogers from Michigan on this side, the GAIN Act, this is uh, in regard to uh, the shortage of antibiotics. Uh, so a different uh, disease, a different uh, category of, 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 of drugs, but uh, equally as important. Can you tell me, Dr. Cantillon, uh, how applying sci scientific advances such as the use of biomarkers or, or, dr or drug development tools might aid in drug development in this country? Yes, thank you for the question. So actually as a medical director of Alzheimer's and other programs with Shearing Plow over the last couple of years before CAMD, I did sit on an industry advisory group for this ADNI trial that Dr. Bobka was speaking about, and so was giving some advice into the choice of the instruments, and as these markers were being developed, had my hat on in terms of both drug development and facing the FDA with a package for an approval for a treatment. The trouble is, when you're coming from a drug developer's point of view, this is all very cutting edge. And as I said in my testimony, the science by itself is truly not enough. It's not enough to have exciting markers that may predict something that's going on in the brain. If it can't be harnessed into a path and a development uh, steps to use a new drug and prove that. I'll give you an example. So we, we talked just now about the cerebrospinal fluid, where we know that there are certain proteins that can indicate both a disease and perhaps even the type of progression, predictive. We would take that, and we are taking that, and in a collaborative way with the whole field, so we're just one of uh, the collaboration that I had mentioned, look at the evidence for that in a critical way, in a, in a scientific manner. The regulatory science part is having our regulatory scientific colleagues internationally review that in a context of use. Does that allow you to choose a population for a trial who are not yet demented. So to call somebody demented, you don't need to be a doctor. It's very clear that the person does not have their brain functioning in the same way for memory and so forth. To find somebody who's very early in the disease or even hasn't fully shown clinical symptoms, you need these markers. Can we ask for FDA regulatory approval that these are standardized in such a way that they can become a tool a st standard tool publicly available that any company in this country or anywhere else can take off the shelf and put into a program such that by using this tool, they don't have to defend that tool when they go in front of the FDA. That uh, process has already been done in this qualification. And instead, they can focus on their own particular drug that then fits into this pattern and can use that patient population, for example, to show progression over time. Do those people who have low tau high tau, low, low A beta, or a particular brain uh, picture with amyloid, do they progress faster than others? And can you show a difference in the people that were on drug and off drug? That is how the whole development process can make use of this science and translate it into something that the FDA can then approve or not approve. 
the FTA did put out a guidance document partially from working with us just two months ago, and in that the steps are laid out very clearly. Essentially, it is show us the evidence. Very similar my, than my a time. My time is rapidly drawn to a close, but let me let me quickly ask you: <coughs> uh, Do you think it's appropriate that such uh, such drug development tools or biomarkers that they first receive approval by the FDA before being used by industry and the agency to measure the safety and efficacy of the drug? Do you think that the FDA would have to approve this off-the-shelf uh, kind of testing ahead of time? So the FDA has the possibility to just approve for commercial use or other use, but that's not within the context of use that we're talking about. The context of use would help that tool help define a particular population. So, for example, let me give you another, from another consortium, we developed some markers for renal injury, for kidney injury. They were brand new and they could allow a drug developer or anybody to show if something was happening very early on before the kidney actually was destroyed. These markers went through this qualification process and are being very widely used by all companies, including my, my former one, to make decisions about drug development. When they go to the FDA, they don't need to defend those markers for kidney Yes. Because they've already been approved. Yes. So it takes a lot of that work away and you can focus on the drug. Doctor, thank you. That does answer my question. And uh, I'll yield back, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Gentlewoman from the Virgin Islands. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Morrison Bogorad. Okay. Um, given the disproportionate impact of Alzheimer's on minorities, is the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparity Research, which was formerly the center among the NIH institutions that you're collaborating with? And also, um, what is, how diverse are, are the participants in the clinical trials? Well, it's, it's, again, something that we've paid particular attention to, especially in our flagship clinical trials, the Alzheimer's Disease um, Clinical Consortium. And there we, we've made it a rule that um, a certain number of people in each clinical trial that we run there are minorities. And that's been extraordinarily helpful because it's meant that I think a fifth of the folk who participate in certain of these trials are minorities. So it's amazing what a little rule will do. Okay. And um, we certainly, we've got quite a, a vibrant program in epidemiology looking at um, Alzheimer's disease in minorities and comparing that with Alzheimer's disease in whites. And I would say at the moment the results are somewhat equivocal because um, many of the ways in which you define Alzheimer's disease are also um, very dependent on things like the education of the person who is taking the tests. And many older African Americans, of course, for other reasons, haven't had the education that they should have had. And so they don't do as well in these tests as they should. It doesn't mean they've got Alzheimer's, however. So this, this is a very, very thorny issue, and we've got a number of very good researchers working on that to actually try to tease out what, what part of the minority um, burden of Alzheimer's disease is real and I, I do believe some of it is because some of the, the possible things that cause Alzheimer's disease are, as you're aware, much more prevalent in minority communities, things like heart disease. Right. But I do believe that some of the, some of the numbers are a little bit over, um, perhaps <coughs> larger than they should be because of this um, issue on how to determine Alzheimer's disease in people with different backgrounds. Yeah. That's interesting because my impression is that it's underdiagnosed rather than overdiagnosed um, in minorities. But, um, and 
I'll let anybody comment on that. But I wanted to ask Mr. Johns, this is, let's see if I can get this question straight. Because I know this hearing is really about getting more funding for Alzheimer's. And Mr. Johns, I heard your argument very clearly about the need for an increased investment in Alzheimer's um, to reduce the cost of healthcare eventually and to perhaps even save Medicare. Um, we've been trying to get CBO to score prevention for a while, actually introduced legislation to have them do that if they're asked by the committee. So without having scoring in place for prevention, how do you foresee getting the funding needed, especially in a Congress that's um, committed to cutting spending? And how important do you think scoring prevention is to this particular issue? Well, certainly as you, um, as you say, uh, the fact is that uh, CBO won't score what I would describe as a game changer. Uh, that is a problem I know for all of us when we have interest in what would be effectively R&D for our country. You know, we really have, beyond the immediacy of Alzheimer's, we have what is a potential brain drain in our country uh, mm -hmm. as a result of uh, research being attracted overseas. <coughs> While it isn't specific to Alzheimer's, it is a generic and then related to Alzheimer's as well as other medical research. So we have, as a country, uh, to face what is, first of all, a significant uh, problem in that larger regard with medical research, but very specifically in Alzheimer's. And of course, uh, we have the challenge of facing our economic realities uh, and also then funding something that cannot be scored. Uh, we recognize fully the difficulties of this, but we can also see from the projections we've done, and we've gone to outside sources at the Alzheimer's Association to develop what are these data. Uh, we've actually used the CMS data on expenditures on Medicare and Medicaid. We've taken those to Dartmouth. We've had um, uh, the Lewin Group look at all these data, and what we've identified is that $20 trillion cost over the course of the next 40 years. One of the problems we have as a country, of course, is actually addressing problems that are longitudinal. Uh, those of you sitting across from me know that better than I in terms of how hard it is to make those things work. Uh, but we certainly know it too at the Alzheimer's Association and, and any of us here sitting on this side who are trying to change the course of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we have to find the, uh, the national fortitude to address this already enormous problem. Uh, everyone who has the disease today will die with it or of it. Uh, we do not have a treatment that stops or even slows it. Uh, the devastation of the disease at a human level for all of us, all of us who've ex experienced it personally, uh, and for all those who haven't, we, we recognize just how bad that is. Uh, I don't have the easy answer to your question, but the scale of the problem, the enormity of the issue, uh, begs for us to find a way to answer the question so that we can address this now. We are running out of time. Uh, one of the things uh, that uh, Marcel mentioned is that uh, the science community believes ever more that we need to uh, uh, intervene sooner, that the plaques and tangles of the disease are deposited uh, earlier in life, at least 10 years before the symptoms manifest. If, in fact, we don't make these investments relatively soon, the baby boomers, 10 million of whom will have this disease, will be a lost cause. And the devastation at a human level and the economic toll will be solidified if we don't move relatively soon. Thank the gentlewoman. And next we have our uh, Alzheimer's hero here who um, actually sponsored both of the bills that you mentioned, uh, Mr. Johns, the one that I guess is now in the House for action, hopefully next week, as well as the uh, larger bill. Mr. Markey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And uh, thank our witnesses uh, so much uh, for your participation here today. Um, Robert Browning wrote, uh, grow old with me, the best is yet to be. But the truth is that for millions and millions of Americans. Uh, the golden years are now the worst years because of Alzheimer's and the family caregiver who has to help. And so this is now at 4 million or 5 million Americans 
uh, already an epidemic since, as we know, not only does the Alzheimer's patient have the disease, but one family member has it as well. So about 10 million Americans right now are living with it uh, on a daily basis in their homes or uh, in some facility. And, uh, and when it goes up to 12 million times two, you know, 24 million, 25 million people, you know, the caregiver and the patient, um, it's going to be an incredible moment in American history. So we have an incredible responsibility here to make sure uh, that we put in place a plan. And uh, Mr. Chairman, you uh, made a reference uh, to it, um, which is that um, the uh, National Alzheimer's Project Act, which I introduced on this side, along with Christopher Smith, the co-chair of the Alzheimer's Task Force, uh, passed the Senate <coughs> last night. And Senator Bayh and um, uh, Senator Collins did an excellent job in freeing it up, and we will be able to pass that next week uh, on the House floor. And then we will have a plan. Uh, we will have something that makes it possible for us to, uh, uh, to put in place something that is the plan to uh, attack this disease. And it is long overdue, um, uh, but uh, it, it's a good beginning. Uh, so let me ask you this, uh, and maybe you could reflect upon it, uh, Mr. Johns, if you could. Um, last year, the federal government spent $122 billion on uh, helping people with Alzheimer's. Uh, but we only invested $469 million in finding the cure. Uh, and we know we're only at the beginning of an explosion in the bills that are going to come in from across America for uh, the federal government to help families with Alzheimer's. Can you reflect upon that, give us your insight as to how big it's going to become uh, and why it's Im imperative that we act now? Certainly. And uh, let me uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Markey, for your authorship of uh, NAPA and, again, for the leadership uh, of yours and the committees in moving that forward. Certainly, the um, uh, Alzheimer's is already costing uh, the $172 billion in total, the $122 billion you talked about at the, for the federal government. Uh, incidentally, at the Medicare level, Alzheimer's is driving 17 percent of the Medicare budget. Uh, at this Say that again. 17 percent of the Medicare budget is driven by Alzheimer's already today. Uh, the total cost uh, for Alzheimer's, again, to the country will be, uh, and other dimensions, uh, by the middle of the century, in excess of $1 trillion per year. Uh, and by far the, the bulk of that will be the federal government's uh, cost projected from today's levels with no changes uh, so that it simply won't be affordable, uh, not only on the economic front, but again on the human front. Uh, we can't accept what will happen to families. Uh, we don't have the ability to deal with the end-of-life uh, considerations of the long-term care uh, families at some point, dedicated as they are, with 70 percent uh, of the people who have Alzheimer's living at home and cared for at home, at some point that other percentage is a result of the fact that families, no matter how much time they spend, the 24 hours a day that they so often spend as caregivers, especially toward the end of life, is no longer enough or they are simply not capable of handling the difficulty of the care at home so that we are not equipped at this point, as you've indicated, we don't have a plan for any of these things at this point. NAPA will hopefully address that. But we're just not prepared as a country to handle any of these problems at the scale they're going to rise to. Yeah, and I, you know, this is just something that is not as well understood as it should be. My mother had Alzheimer's, and uh, she was a valedictorian. My father was a milkman. And, uh, my father always said it was an honor that my mother married him. And so, and he used to say as well, if the strength of your brain determined who got Alzheimer's, that he would have had it and my mother would have been taking care of him. But we know that this is an equal opportunity uh, disease. And uh, at age 80, 82, 84, 86, 88, my father kept her in our living room, you know, with the arms of a milkman, arms the size of my legs. Um, and he was able to do it. But for many families, it just, it becomes exhausting. You can't do it. There's a point beyond which you need help. And that help comes increasingly from the federal government in the form of $122 billion a year right now 
Um, but I don't think actually we're going to be able to solve the federal budget deficit if we don't dramatically increase the federal investment in research. That's correct. Uh, it'll, be a, it'll be a trillion dollars a year just for Alzheimer's right. uh, care in another 15 years. Absolutely. Uh, and it, it's just a number that is going to increase exponentially. And despite the efforts of people like my father and other families all across the country, these people are heroes, but heroes need help and they need hope. And only the National Institutes of Health really, the Institutes of Hope, really give people the courage to keep on going. So, um, so the, this, this whole effort is uh, absolutely, um, I think it should be the number one issue, to be honest with you, just from a budgetary perspective. For, you know, from a, from a humane perspective, um, yes, but uh, um, uh, it, it's, to me, um, uh, coupled with the Alzheimer's Breakthrough Act, which I've introduced, uh, and the, uh, uh, the HOPE Act, the Health uh, Outcomes Planning and Education Act, um, which we have to focus on. We have to put in place the kind of the ingredients of this plan uh, that make it possible for us to solve this problem. And, I'm, and I commit to you, all of you, that I'm going to continue to just work my heart out uh, to make this something that becomes real in people's lives. And I can't thank you enough, all of you, for all of your work. And Mr. Chairman, I thank you. Uh, for conducting this hearing, um, it's it's a. Uh, uh, I think I don't think there's a more important subject for us to be discussing. As Americans. Thank you, and thank you for all you do, Mr. Markey, on this and other issues, um, Mr. Engel. Well, thank you, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Right in the nick of time. First of all, I want to thank everyone on the panel. Um, this is certainly um, uh, very, very uh, in important and. Um, uh, something that I've had uh, a lot of uh, concern uh, about. Um, I, I, I think that um, what all my colleagues have said, um, this is what we ought to uh, be spending uh, money on um, when we talk about some of the other issues. Um, I, I think we should all agree on, on issues like this. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to um, um, ask unanimous consent to insert my opening statement uh, in the, in the uh, record. And um, let me ask uh, Dr. Cantillon, uh, first of all, thank you for your comments. I was told that comments you made before, and I deeply uh, appreciate uh, you're saying that uh, the Critical Path Initiative is certainly something that's near and dear uh, to my heart. I've, I've strongly supported uh, public-private partnerships, and I'm pleased to learn that, th that this program has been, been very effective in tackling uh, diseases like Alzheimer's. And you, you mentioned in your testimony, Doctor, that one way Congress can be helpful is to provide the resources to increasing staffing levels at FDA. And as I mentioned before, uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, we need to increase resources for the FDA to help them bring new drugs to market. But given the limited resources we're working with, I was wondering if you could address other ways uh, that we might help break down the barriers to uh, transition, translational research and help fill in the gap that's opened up between biomedical researchers uh, and the patients who need their discoveries, uh, which we unfortunately refer to as the value of death. Indeed. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for your support for these partnerships. I, I think that the partnerships, the private-public partnerships, are certainly a major part of the answer in this fiscal environment. So we've all said several times that this is about to bankrupt our country and many other aging countries around the world, and there aren't unlimited funds either to put into any one particular disease. And maybe we need to look at an innovative science and an innovative way of answering some of these questions that have come up. So the FDA is going to be faced with a lot of the new science arriving in different ways. Part of what we had been working together with them was to put a process in place to translate this science, not just, let's say, from the test tube to the rat, but all the way through to a new medication at the very end. In other words, to make a, a process available to be able to gather the evidentiary information. The FDA doesn't have but a few handful of staff that we deal with on, on a very regular basis, and as I'd mentioned, are indeed part of our consortium. And the Europeans, in fact, are in a similar situation. So what I was referring to is basically stretching the dollar and the people that we have. And part of what we are doing and seek to do more of is, in fact, build in in-kind work. Um, and there's a lot you can do with that. There's a lot of scientists, just like there was a lot of data, who have been siloed. 
be it within government, I used to be at NIH, or within companies. Once a trial has failed, that data is essentially put on a shelf somewhere. Definitely with the kind of tools we're talking about, those data can be re-examined at very least, and perhaps there'll be some pearls in there, but they also can be mined for the learnings that are there and shared. That's, that's public, it belongs to all of us. And so what we put together are these various methods to do that. It's, I would say, an innovative tool to get people to give up their silo thinking, look at a pre-competitive space for companies, and even for academics, that they actually don't own the data that they've generated that belongs to the people. And if we can set up that way, have it as a database, for example, that I'd mentioned, but also the other tools, then that is freed for the best mind in the world to attack. And that's actually a very efficient way of doing that. Well, thank you for, for pointing that out. It, it, it certainly is a shame if, if research is put on the shelf and no one else can get to it or, or look at it. Um, this has to be a collaborative effort, obviously, and um, you know, thank you for pointing that out. Um, I'd like to um, ask a question of uh, Mr. Hall and, and Mr. Johns. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which is referred to as health care you know, reform that we just passed here. We, we were uh, doing this for, as you know, for almost two years. There was a provision in there that improves access to home and community-based care for patients. Um, uh, we know that these services greatly improve the quality of life uh, for Alzheimer's patients. Um, Health care reform, uh, as we know, strengthens the long-term care system for chronic and other long-term neurological conditions, both by eliminating the arbitrary caps on treatment, which we did, that was one of the crowning glories of this bill, and by expanding coverage to include, include pre-existing conditions, which is the second uh, pillar that is so important in this bill. Um, in an effort to improve upon existing programs that positively impact Alzheimer's patients and help you provide services, can you give us some insight as to how these provisions will improve your ability to provide services for Alzheimer's patients and their families? And can you also address what other federal programs exist that help you deliver services to more patients? Oh, please. Okay. Well. Uh, I personally think that, uh, you know, all of our constituents are in a position, especially as I've mentioned previously, that 70% uh, or more of uh, people are cared for at home. Uh, all of our constituents who are in a position to be at home uh, need additional assistance. Um, as we see how all of this unfolds, we'll learn better exactly how it can best serve the individuals uh, who are in those uh, situations. Uh, so we certainly always uh, have high hopes for what would help to be a better care at home uh, because we know, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, that we do, not have the, uh, we do not have the capability to really accommodate all the folks who would ultimately perhaps need to go to long-term care. So additional ways to find ability to handle people at home is critical to the entirety of the Alzheimer's uh, constituency. You know, and additionally, I think uh, we all agree that the longer we can prolong institutionalization, you know, the better it is for the federal budget, for sure. Um, but, you know, families do need enormous amount of support. The conversation we've had here around research is pivotal. There is no doubt we, we need to find a cure as quickly as possible, and any amount of money that we could put towards this disease, you know, would be an enormous win at this point. But, you know, the reality is, is that a cure does not seem to be coming anytime soon, and so it does rely on care, and it does rely on those families. So any type of provision that supports uh, individuals with the disease and cares for them and provides for them the greatest quality of life for the longest period of time is, is great, but also to recognizing, you know, the support that is truly needed for caregivers across the country at this point, at this juncture, where we are in relationship to a cure is, is really the critical step. It's what we need to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, just very quickly, uh, and I know that the afternoon is getting long, and I appreciate that our witnesses have done a wonderful job. Uh, I, I guess I would direct this to uh, Mr. Hall. Uh, can you talk about the benefits of early detection uh, as it relates to both the financial realities that patients face uh, and for making end-of-life decisions? 
Sure. You know, the Alzheimer's Foundation of America hosts and uh, is the uh, initiator of uh, National Memory Screening Day. And uh, the reason that we do that is really just to sort of educate the public as a whole and then to allow individuals to participate in memory screenings across the country that isn't a diagnosis for Alzheimer's, but rather is looking to see if there is an indication of the, I guess, the most common manifestation of Alzheimer's disease, which is memory <coughs> problems. Um, that initiative to us is really important because of the fact that it points to uh, a possible early diagnosis of this disease. It is really critical because our experience at the Alzheimer's Foundation of America is that our phone calls, our emails uh, in the volume that we receive, every single one of those families is in crisis and chaos. And so they are really scrambling now to figure out what does Alzheimer's disease care look like? Uh, what am I now responsible for as a family? What is required of me legally, financially? You know, what, what is required of my time? And so early diagnosis in, in our interpretation is, is really important because one, I, I think um, you know, the, some of the treatments that are available right now are able to offset the progression of the symptoms of the disease and thereby the person enjoys, the person with the disease enjoys a higher quality of life for a longer period of time. And I have to tell you, traveling the country, uh, and I'm sure or uh, Harry could say the same thing. We have not met one single family anywhere that hasn't said that all they wanted was one more good day, you know, with their loved one who is in the grips of Alzheimer's disease. And so if we can prolong one more day, I think that's a win. That's what we have right now. Uh, but additionally, planning in this you know, situation is, is enormous. Um, you know, uh, educating, empowering uh, the family unit so that they understand you know, it's, it's generally one to four individuals caring for every person with Alzheimer's disease, but also then uh, enabling uh, organizations to, to surround those families, to hold their hands, to walk with them on the journey and support them, to connect those families at the point of diagnosis with those necessary resources, uh, instilling hope, which is probably the, you know the the greatest missing link in Alzheimer's disease but if you know at least by surrounding a family with hope you're doing just that you're, you're giving them a lifeline and you're letting them know that they're not going to be alone through the process um, that takes care of an enormous emotional toil uh, for a family which is probably the biggest piece of the picture and then if you're able to bring in other resources of, of financial planning and legal planning and, and what all this looks like as far as care in the future those are enormous wins in alleviating the burden, stress, depression uh, for caregivers. Right. Thank you. Thank you. That uh, concludes our questions, but I just want to thank all of you. It's obvious from listening to the questions and, and your testimony how important this is, uh, both now and in the future. We, we do plan to move the one bill uh, that passed the Senate on the House floor next week. And, of course, the larger bill will have to wait for another time. But this is, uh, you know, I just want to stress how important really uh, and how we really plan to prioritize this. So thanks a lot. Let me mention that um, you may get additional questions from the members to answer in writing. The members are supposed to submit those within the next 10 days or so, but you may get those. Uh, and the clerk will, t will notify you of that. Uh, but without objection, this meeting of the subcommittee is adjourned. Coming up next, more about the current quality of care for people with Alzheimer's disease. We'll hear from the president of the Alzheimer's Foundation of America. After that, a memorial service for civil rights activist Dorothy Height. Later, a forum on the best...